the Home Services Summit webinar series. Um, my name is Scott Abbott. I'm one of the founders of Five Star Painting and the CEO of Five Star Franchising. And I have the pleasure of having Michael on from Mosquito Shield, who's the brand president there. Uh, as you know, this these series is all about bringing you guys content and information and as to how home service companies uh, find success. And so uh, in, in this case, there's an exceptional circumstance here where Mosquito Shield has had incredible growth over the last couple of years. And so I'm looking forward to interviewing Michael on how he has achieved that. Uh, quick intro around Pronexus. You know, our, our mission at Pronexus is to transform the home services industry through voice, chat, text, and instant booking. Uh, our format, if you've been on here before, is quite for straightforward. I will ask some questions for 45 minutes. We'll have a nice conversation. And then at the end of that uh, 45 minutes, feel free at any point in time in the chat to just go ahead and post any questions you have for Michael or myself. And we'll do our best to get to those and uh, make it a value-added session for everyone involved. Okay, so quick background on Michael. Michael's been with Mosquito Shield for 11 years and has been a, an essential piece of developing Mosquito Shield Franchise Corporation. With a proven track record in marketing and business development and extensive experience in the fast-paced environment of sales, Michael uses his expertise to build high-performance franchise teams through leadership, policies, and procedures, and accountability. And I can speak from personal experience here that he's also a lot of fun to work with, and he runs a great tight ship. Uh, uh, we've had the pleasure of acquiring Mosquito Shield a few months ago. We announced that uh, to be part of Five Star Franchising's home service brand group. And um, amazing team. Uh, the founder, David, who, who's not on the show, is uh, incredibly technical in the business. In fact, Michael, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. Mosquito Shield really started before mosquitoes was even a thing, wasn't it? Well, why don't we just go back to the beginning of how things started? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, happy to and uh, happy to be here. Thanks a lot, Scott. Um, yeah, David founded the the idea of, of residential mosquito control all the way back in 2001. Um, beautiful night in September being ruined out on his deck um, here in Massachusetts. Uh, he had been in home services. He was a franchisee in a lawn care concept. Um, so he knew, you know, products and getting trucks on properties and technicians taking care of lawns and figured there had to be a way to to morph that into some way to control mosquitoes. And that was the really the beginning of um, of Mosquito Shield. Struggled in the beginning for a couple of years and uh, and then really refined the product side of things with our own proprietary blend. And then that's when we really started to see um, retention rates um, you know, outperform lawn care, word of mouth outperform lawn care. It was costing less to acquire. They were staying longer and they were raving more. So we really started, you know, to put our attention on the mosquito side of things. And, and um, interesting enough, I had started with him in 2008 during the crash for his lawn care company. He hired me as a consultant to come in and build a new sales process for lawn care. So I did that over a period of time, super successful, and um, and then around 2011 is when he pulled me in and said, you know, I think we have a chance to do something nationally with mosquito control. Back then, there was only one national franchise. And um, and yeah. I spent the next two years building the model and we launched it in 2013. Wow. Um, love it. And, and obviously, you know, amazing success since then. And we're going to dive into what exactly that means and what you've accomplished even the last couple of years. But before we do, I want to, for those of you who are in, uh, that are on the show right now, that are in the home services industry that revolve around you know, recurring services, which is a unique aspect, right? There's there's install type services like painting or bathrooms, and, and which we've been involved with for years. But, you know, mosquito control or pest control or other, you know, maid services, they, they really focus on retention rates, right? And so you said in lawn control, you, you mentioned how you were able to boost your retention numbers in mosquito control substantially through a unique blend that is a, that really comes with kind of traditional mosquito control. Maybe if you would just just speak to like what is like what what should what should be a, a benchmark for retaining customers in mosquito control or, or lawn care? Like what do you what's your experience in that? Yeah, home services, um, the recurring model, lawn care specifically. That's what we always compared to because we knew it so well. David been in it for twenty years, so. Um, lawn care companies, you know, are doing well if they're getting 65% of their customer base coming back. Um, a lot of the big guns out there, you know, they're 
they're lower than that. It's like a turn and burn model. But um, some of the existing mosquito mm -hmm. companies that are out there operating in the low 70s, so they're doing a decent job over that benchmark. Um, we yep. uh, have historically been in the high 80s. So we finished last year nationally at 88%. Um, you know, we've wow. got some locations nationally, individually that, that run in the low 90s to give us that, that blended number of 88%. Wow, that is incredible. So, you know, 88% is kind of the, the golden mark that everyone wants to kind of shoot for. And you have some franchises at over the 90% rate. You mentioned that there, and I've had the pleasure of visiting your facilities, uh, touring the plant that, mm -hmm. uh, where we, the proprietary blend is made. Uh, the smell from that stuck with me yeah. on the plane all the way back home <laughs> in my suitcase. Yeah. Um, but, you know, how did that, I mean, that, and that really does come down to kind of David's nature, right? And he, he loves to, to kind of invent and tinker and create tinker, and modify yeah. and improve upon things. I've seen him in terms of how he does things, a really unique approach, uh, which is, has been kind of the secret sauce, right? Um, maybe just talk a little bit about like what, what uh, without giving the secret sauce ingredients out, right? You don't have to do that. Yeah. But maybe like, what did you see happen? What was retention before you started introducing the secret sauce into that mosquito control element and it, 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 it did add a lot of value to the organization by doing that. Yeah, I, I, I want to unpack that a little bit, Scott, because there's a couple of things that happened when we first started back in 2001. It was before me, but, um, you know, we were only operating at like a 40 or 50 percent retention rate. Um, but two things were going on. We were spraying at, uh, at much longer intervals. We started at a four week, like a once a month program. We went to three weeks, it got marginally better. We went to two weeks, it got significantly better. But then we realized understanding um, the science and mosquito biology that, um, you, you really needed to be on the, on the reproductive schedule of the mosquito, not on your convenient schedule to get your text back out on the road. And that changed the business completely. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, nobody's figured that out except mosquito shield or everyone's still spraying on a 21 day or a, or a 28 day program. We're spraying every 10 to 17 days by monitoring the weather in the mosquito population. But Back in about 2004, 2005 um, is when Dave started tinkering with with um, with all natural oils. You know, they were out there. They were known to be um, effective against mosquitoes, but, you know, no one had ever really taken that to the next level and kind of blending them together and trying them at different mix rates and um, uh, different percentages mixed with the overall blend. So everyone has control product and can go out and kill the mosquito, right? The problem that they have is they wait yeah. too long to come back and they're facing another generation every time they come back. So the all natural oils that we created do two things. They mask and repel. So they mask your CO2, which is the only way a mosquito finds you on a property. So it's a scent blocker. They can't find yeah. you. They can't bite you. And it's got known irritants and literally moves them to neighboring properties. We charge extra though if you want to pick a neighbor. Yeah. I think there's just for, for anyone in the home services category though, I'm, you know, in, in any marketer that's ever, that's listening or, or maybe participating in a business in the home services category, you, you know, you always gonna be different, right? You got to find some way of differentiating yourself from the competition. And so what you've done is you've found a way to actually market and include a different ingredient, a different method that's been, that other people are using a different approach to things that allows you to sell over your competition. So I think that's the, one of the big highlights and takeaways I get from this is like, whatever your business may be, you got to find that way to be different and sell from the, from that angle, which I love here. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe let's just kind of brag a little bit for you, Michael. I, you know, you started in 2013 as a franchise concept, as you mentioned, having invented the category prior to that. Uh, and then you saw, you know, some real success in the business that was growing. But in the last couple of years, it's been, you know, incredible. You were ranked, Mosquito Shield was ranked uh, the 30th fastest growing franchise system in the world. In, and by Entrepreneur Magazine in 2022, that's saying something, right? That is like, that's incredible. Talk about that growth. Let us know, like, how many territories did you sell in 2021, in 2020? Uh, you know, what did that look like? And what was, what unlocked that for you? Sure. I'll go backwards from that. So we did over uh, 200 territories last year alone, 201 territories in uh, 2021. Um, in the last 24 months, we've done 200 and. 48 territories in the last 24 months. Um, so what unlocked that I think was wow. a couple of things. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, 
definitely historic, epic growth. Um, to your point, we're super proud of it. Um, we knew we were poised and ready for it. Uh, what unlocked it, I think, was the, um, you know, the pandemic hit right, right in, um, right at the beginning of this run for us. First week or two, we we definitely mm-hmm. had panicked like everybody. We didn't know how it was going to affect, and then we kind of looked back on our twenty year history and realized that as a company, as an individual company in Massachusetts. We saw double digit growth right after 9-11. People weren't traveling. They were kind of just staying really close to home, really worried about what was happening during the crash in 2008, 2009. Yep. Um, lawn care plummeted, but our mosquito customers stayed with us. You know, they could figure out how to fertilize their lawn if they wanted to, but they couldn't enjoy their backyard comfortably. So we saw growth during that. Yeah. And then um and then quickly realized just in early April of 2020, so weeks after the pandemic hit, that um, we were going to take that ride again. People were stuck in their homes, stuck in their backyards. So two things happened. They wanted to enjoy their yards. They were canceling those big vacations. They were reinvesting in their properties. They were ordering, you know, in-ground pools or installing fire pits or outdoor kitchens. And um, and then the other key thing that I don't think a lot of people realized was the the optics the visual exposure that our local franchisees got so because people were home so a year before that scott we'd be spraying yep. somebody's backyard in the middle of the day and nobody would see the van or hear the machine or because they were at work interesting and now everybody was peeking out their windows saying yep. what's going on over there and it just really you know grew from there and it was a little bit of a wildfire so yeah i think that was um i think the marketing so people were were they're on their phones at home during the day, getting served ads, uh, postcards in the mail were being looked at. Like all of those things were sort of, um, you know, anecdotally driving growth um, along with people being home. So it was, it was really the perfect storm for us. That's an, that is, a, I mean, it's an interesting point. You just mentioned something I thought was um, really valuable for those who are listening. The machine's running, right? Being there, being at, present on properties when your other customer potential customers are home is a strategy that I didn't even think about uh, that just you kind of fell upon by the fact of people working from home all of a sudden now hearing the, the vans or the, the you know machines are very loud as they spray the foliage in the, around the property right and so obviously it creates some curiosity and yeah. some interest because uh, someone's enjoying a, a mosquito free backyard and it's not them that is um, super interesting now I know that you you mentioned that uh, you know you, you sold 248 units in two years, 201 territories in 2021. Uh, I know that part of those sales came from what we call multi-pack or multi-unit deals. Let's just talk about that for a minute. Uh, you, when did you decide to start going? Was it you all? Have you always sold multi-packs? When did you go to multi-packs? How many do you sell typically when you do sell multi-pack? Yeah. So a couple of things. I mean, back 10 years ago when I started, I didn't know what I was doing and my territories were mapped, you know, really big. And then over the years, I realized they were too big and they, they started getting smaller and smaller and a little bit more manageable for franchisees. So I think that was the beginning of kind of changing. Um, so when somebody bought one 10 years ago, they were really buying probably back then seven or eight. Right. So that I think that was part of it. Um, so they're classified as a single unit from the franchise agreement, but it's a multi-pack now. So just the fact that the um, we've learned our market better, um, our target audience, you know, who um, who needs to be there for the franchisees to be successful. So out of the, you know, 200 yeah. plus owners from, I mean, territories from last year, the 248, I think make up about 102 owners. So we're averaging uh, about 2.5, 2.6, um, territories per owner in our franchise system right now. Yeah. So that's, and I think you mentioned that's important to note, and that is, and I've seen it happen time and time again, even businesses I've founded or started, as well as businesses we work with or look at, very often in home services, we start with these really big territories. Like we're giving people, you know, 150,000 households, 200,000 households, 250,000 households to for their market because we think that they need that to really grow their business. And over time, you realize that it's about market penetration and having that market penetration actually yields a greater result through the power of focus. And so I've seen it happen time and time again, where we just see those businesses over time, they bring down that size of territory, something more manageable 
in, in our case, we went from, I think, 200,000 to 75,000 households at Flash Pain when we finally sold. Uh, similarly, we've done that with Bass Solutions and other brands where we did it get, the power of focus yields a greater result. And it also means other franchisees are benefiting from that market penetration. So that's a, a great takeaway from, from this conversation. Um, now, you, you guys did use a, what we call an FSO or franchise sales organization at, at one point. Um, maybe talk about that. It was Franchise Fast Lane. You guys, when did you guys sign with them? And, and talk, tell us about that decision and what, why you chose to use them. Yeah, I had handled FranDev from day one, uh, just myself. So I had brought on, um, you know, 50 something owners through the seven or eight years of, um, you know, plugging away with it. And, um, and in, uh, the beginning of 2020, January, February timeframe, there had been some, um, some roll-ups of the two other, you know, we were always, I always thought we were in the top three mosquito franchises, but we were kind of a, a little bit of a distant third. We sold a different model as well, Scott. We sold these bigger territories. Um, we did not expect owners to just be an owner operator with one van. You know, we really wanted them to scale to a, a multi-van operation. So a little bit of a different uh, model than what the other two had been doing, but they've been acquired and there seemed to be this vacuum uh, that had, had been created. And it seemed like, again, the time to strike and really um, put, put a stake in the ground for being the leader, you know, the 20 plus year leader in mosquito control and um, all the proprietary, you know, product and equipment and everything we had to, to share and really great validation. I think that's the other thing. We had had some really big success stories and we knew that the time was right. I had been working with, you know, been kind of courted by a bunch of FSOs up to that point and, um, and just really felt, mm -hmm. um, felt a really comfortable fit with Fastlane and um, took over a year for us to like kind of come to terms on how we wanted to do it and when we wanted to launch with them. And I think we signed just in March of 2020, right when things were, you know, hitting the fan, so to speak, and we hit the summer conferences. Yeah. So it was um, the July conferences with the big broker networks uh, in 2020. So really it's been, um, you know, we're just coming on two years. So it's been less than two years in the network that we've had this epic run. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you think has really made that partnership work for you? And I know you obviously were very careful who you selected, uh, I mean, Fastlane has a great reputation. Um, you froze on me. Ryan I, I and didn't... Carrie over there. I'm sorry, Scott. You froze for a minute. Oh, what did what do you did you do to make the most of that partnership? Um, well, I, I'd, I'd advise anybody that's considering a, an FSO relationship that um, you really got to be involved in the, from the beginning and really set the foundation of who your brand is and and what your core sort of pillars are um to establish what type of um prospects they're bringing to you right they've got to learn and understand um who you are as a company um what your uh again what's important to you and i also think kind of really understand and, and learn who your existing franchisees are right because if we we were in business for a long time so over that period of time you start to yeah. you know develop a kind of a a uh, um, profile right around who your target franchisee is. And I think um, I've seen uh, franchisors that partner with FSOs and just let them run with it. And it really can, um, you know, drive growth, but not necessarily the right growth. Right. So I, I feel like mm -hmm. um, the seven or eight years of me handling it all alone with very little turnover. Right. And even in this epic run, uh, we've had very little percentage wise, we've had very little turnover of anyone leaving or wanting out of the system two years later. Right. So it's like, I think that's super important. But what I yeah. learned was um, I had to get involved early to really make sure that the um, the VP of the brand and the director of the brand were um, part of our brand. Right. They, and, and I think a credit to Fastlane, they hire really well. Um, they train really well. And um, it's a group of really talented people that know franchising and, and uh, you know, both um, both my VP from Fastlane and my director ended up buying Mosquito Shield franchises. So that was some pretty <laughs> impressive validation for them um, and validation for me that they had all these brands to choose from 
had been in franchising for yep. years and, and we checked all the boxes for him. So that was that was exciting. But I think um, I also think the other tip I'd give everybody is that you um, you hold the keys. It's your brand. Right. And you can't um, there's a lot of pressure in, in Fran Dev because there's a lot of money involved in Fran Dev. And I think that yep. um, you have to stick to your um what's important to you as a brand and, and, um, and learn to say no. Right. So there is the opportunity and mm -hmm. you, you own and you've earned that opportunity to say no to candidates. And I think if you do that early on, and if you get involved in the process early on, then, um, they start to learn what type of candidate you're looking for. Right. So it just helps build the process from the beginning. So saying no, when it's the right time to say no, and, um, and the other thing is I, I host a leadership call every Tuesday at four o'clock. So anybody in the pipeline can dial into yeah. that call. And uh, if I get the list of the next confirmation day and I don't recognize somebody from being on, I won't let them come to my confirmation day if they haven't taken the time to come on a Tuesday validation call for an hour. So it's just setting the expectations of what's important, you know, for your own brand. I like that, that uh, you've created some structure. You know, it's, there's a rhythm to it. The franchise sales team knows that they can put people to that call every week. Uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. I love the fact that you've got your franchise sales team have bought in enough that they're buying locations and they're running them. Obviously, that's a, it's a highlight. You know, they really believe in what they're selling. Uh, lots of upsides, right? Clearly, they did a great job selling a lot of units for you. Uh, you mentioned, though, something that I think is probably worth exploring a little bit more. And maybe if we could just talk a little bit about the downside, like what, what would you say would be a con or a downside to using FSO from your experience so far? Yeah, there wasn't a lot for me, honestly. I, I think what, what I struggled with um, on the dev side for me before we partnered was volume. I've been in sales my whole life. I thought I mm -hmm. had a pretty, a pretty good structure for me to hand it over. I had to be impressed with their structure. Um, uh, I think, you know, Ryan, and Kerry did an amazing job of building a model that brought people through the pipeline in a timely manner and kept them on point and on track to get them to the, the finish line. Um, again, the downside in the beginning was it was definitely overwhelming, right? I mean, we went from, um, you know, yeah. going at 25 miles an hour to going a hundred miles an hour. And uh, so um, being, being able to scale internally to support all of that, that added some, um, some stress internally in the home office that um, was a downside just because I wasn't prepared for it. I wasn't expecting, you know, they had said yeah. to me, it takes 18 months to really learn a brand and start to get momentum. Well, 18 months later, we've done 248 territories with them. So we blew that out of the water. So that, that yeah. was, um, it, you know, it's a blessing and a curse, right? It's like the curse was not really being prepared for yeah. that type of growth. Um, but it was the volume that it brought. And then the other thing I think is just, um, Again, there was a lot of pressure in the beginning, right? So that that's the downside, like really, um, really standing your ground on, you know, they, they wanted to impress the, the networks, right? They wanted to make the, the top performers in those networks happy with any leads that they put into the pipeline. And, and um, you know, so that, that was the, I would say the downside to it was just learning and navigating um, really a, a part of this industry that I had no experience in before. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I think a really valid point, right? It, it, no matter whether you're using FSO or whether you're using a franchise sales team internally, being able to say no and having that ability to say no to uh, certain candidates that just aren't the right fit, something you have to always retain. And, uh, but it can be hard, right? Especially where you've got an organization like, like that, like, uh, fast lane that can move 200 units. It's, it can be hard. That's well said. Uh, Michael, let's, let's talk a little bit about that shift, right? Because you went from larger territories, as you brought in fast lane, you, you kind of shrank them. You went to multi-pack average sales of like 2.6 units or 2.5 units per owner. Tell me about the franchise fee. Did that change? Do you offer a discount if you add a second or third territory? And talk about that, if you don't mind. We do. Um, and it, it did change. We, you know, we used to charge 30,000. Um, they brought us right up to 49.5, which we learned was pretty much standard um, with anyone we were, you know, going up against or 
So that that uh, so we went up to forty nine five for a single unit. It does stair step down a little bit, so it's yep. an additional forty thousand for a second, um, additional thirty thousand for the third. So it's uh, eighty nine five and okay. one nineteen five for a three pack, um, and it kind of just goes down all the way there up, you go. okay, up to ten. So um, so one nineteen one hundred nineteen thousand five hundred for a three pack is kind of where we seem to fall. Got it. Yeah, that's um, that's a, that's a good tip for those of you who are looking at doing multi packs, right? So on the franchise fee side of things, that's always been something I've found. And we, when we first started five star painting, we used to sell it for thirty thousand for a new market and forty thousand for existing territory. And we and since then, we just I think we're now selling our, our franchises or some of them for sixty thousand dollars for one territory. And the reality is is that uh, we are attracting at least we, our my experience has been more higher capitalized. Candidates, stronger candidates are coming and buying a little more serious than what we had in the past. And I'd love to get your thoughts on this. You know, if someone buys three territories, it's one hundred and almost twenty thousand dollars. You know, that affects their capitalization. Has that? Have you seen that being a problem where people are buying a three pack and they just aren't well capitalized post transaction? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it actually, I think it's helped us filter out um, some people because what when when you get that explosive growth and then a lot of those new locations get out of the gate running really well and, and validation is really strong and they're on the so we also host a thursday call with franchisees so anyone in the pipeline can get on and every thursday at four o'clock and talk to we've got a host of different franchisees that volunteer to participate in that and they're hearing their success stories and they're asking well how many territories do you own and they're saying three or four three or four or three three it, it prompts them to realize, well, I want, I want to do what they did. I want to be like them. And they're thinking three pack out of the beginning. The, the, one of the challenges for us, Scott, is that we have, um, there's a very, mostly around the entire country for the most part, there's a big seasonal component to this business. So we actually, even though you can be home based, mm -hmm. so we're considering like a, we're considered like a low cost franchise. Um, our item seven is right around a little more, a little less than a hundred thousand. So, um, you know, you qualify, qualifies for SBA Express and it's right in that like sweet spot. Um, but we ask for more from them from a liquidity standpoint because they got to get through those first two seasons. They don't get a 12 month runway. If they open up in Minnesota, they get five or six months at the first crack at it and they go dark and they got to wait till that next spring yeah. to go at it again. So that's why we look for a little bit more well capitalized people. Um, but they see the payoff on, at, at the, on the backside of that. So I think part of that's an education on the, in the pipeline when, when, um, you know, when you're, when your sales team is working with people, you know, being really upfront about the challenges of the first few seasons, we never, you know, um, gloss over that. I think it's important that you really set the right expectations. And I think that's helped, helped us a lot. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I got a question here. Actually, I'm going to dive in because it's on this specific topic. Uh, Kevin Bryant, hi, Kevin. Great, great to have you on the show. Asked a question: Do you count your multi packs as one unit or three unit deals uh, for a three pack? And I think uh, to be clear on the numbers we we discussed here, if we if you sold 248 units in the last couple of years, that is that we would count those as territories, right, Michael? Those are territories not owners. So there's 102 owners that make up the 248, Kevin. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that, I hope that answers your question. And then someone else asked, uh, what did you say is the size of territory population or household count? Uh, I don't know if we actually mentioned it or not, but yeah, what how, I know it, it by our painting, we went from like 200,000 to 75,000, but at Mosquito Shield, what's the size of your territory? A single unit is 50,000 single family homes. We've never really looked at one population. Unit, so one territory is 50,000. 50,000. And we do, we do an overage, right? So if they come in at 60, you know, they're going to pay um, 49.5 plus 10,000. It's a thousand dollars. It's a dollar per, you know, home over that. So um, that's how we cover overages. Um, but 50,000 yep. is a, a single unit. Single family homes. Got it. We're very specific. And how, much, did, how did that change, Michael? Just give a, some context on that, because you went now. Currently, it's fifty thousand for one territory. Where was it, you know, ten years ago? 
three hundred, three hundred thousand homes. Yeah, three hundred thousand homes uh, in a territory is now down to fifty thousand. Yeah, uh, that's and I, I, that's I know great. we talked about um, it earlier on on the call, but I feel like that's some. If anyone's in the like emerging stage of this or thinking about this, like that's huge advice. Like it's a it's a fear of failure, right? I mean, for me, um, back in 2013 when we started, we were coming from a local company here in Massachusetts that had 3,000 customers, um, doing well over a million dollars of revenue in six months' time, and my only marching orders from our founder was make sure it's big enough to be successful that if we ever had to go in and take it over, we'd own a million dollar branch, right? So that was like, I didn't know what that meant, you know, and I definitely overdeveloped um, and gave away way too much real estate. Now, yeah. the good thing is I gave it to really great people that are still in our system and, and killing it. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't advise that out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it's a common thing I see happening over and over again when people start in franchising. For, you know, they just uh, often and it kind of almost part of your story, right, Michael, with David, you know, he came from a franchisee perspective, a business owner perspective, not from running a large brand. And so you kind of build the model for what you would want, like lots of territory, not a lot of money. Uh, and the reality is, is a healthy brand you, to make a healthy brand, you need to have that market penetration and focus for your franchisees, especially in, in your industry, right? You, you want tight uh, routes, if I'm not mistaken, exactly. Michael, right? You don't, yeah. you don't want to see people driving all around different neighborhoods to service them. You want to see them focusing in on tight geographies. Yeah, I mean, and then the efficiencies as well that go to the bottom line. I mean, they're more profitable business faster because they're not driving all over a huge market area. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Uh, so maybe talk about, you know, your experience over, it's been almost almost 10 years now, uh, the, you know, the kind of candidates that came in prior to using an FSO, you know, and today, has, has a candidate changed much for you, Michael? Are you noticing a different kind of person coming in now that so many of the sales are coming from brokers versus what you were doing before? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so for me, not really. And I think it, I think it goes back to my involvement right out of the um, right out of the gate with Fastlane and making sure that um, I was saying no and saying no for the right reasons. And, and, and um, you know, we just had our first in-person uh, convention for the first time in a few years. And it was, you know, 100 new owners meeting 45, 50 legacy owners. And, um, and it was like one big family. So, I mean, there was, um, there was, uh, it was the synergies were, incredible how similar you know the newsies yeah. were with some of our eight and ten year old z's so i just think that's being um that's a byproduct of being involved with the fso from day one to make sure that they were bringing the type of candidates that i was looking for that's great so let's get into the the uh the discovery day process for a little bit and on your franchise sales you know with how, what you used to do What's happened through COVID? You mentioned you have these weekly calls with candidates before they come for. Uh, do you call it Discovery Day, Michael? We don't. You know, the funny thing is I never called it Discovery Day because I thought that that was um, uh, the discovery's done by the time they're breaking bread with you, right? It should be. They sh there's no discovery left. That's the moment of truth day is what I used to call it before Fastlane. And then um, collectively with Fastlane, I got them to change it to uh, – so we've settled. So all of the brands have a confirmation day. So it's sort of that confirming moment. Um, so we don't call it Discovery Day, but uh, obviously it's a big part of what we do. Um, we've been really successful, Scott, with virtual, and we've we've maintained that. Um, obviously, we were forced uh, into that um, with the pandemic, and uh, but we've again. I'll go back to the process. The candidates that are coming through, they're validating two times a week. Um, a leadership one on Tuesday, mm -hmm. a franchisee on Thursday, a really rigid process with the FSO. Um, so they're really ready by the time they, they come to our confirmation day. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, we have an extremely high close rate, but we do it virtually. So one of the things we do do is we host a happy hour on, uh, the night before. So typically a Monday evening, evening at seven 30. Um, I have all of my team. Mm -hmm. Um, come on 
and they're all in black with mosquito shield. And um, we send out a really nice, nice gift box to all of the participants ahead of time that have red shirts and um, a lot of local, uh, they get saltwater taffy and Boston baked beans and um, Cape Cod potato chips and a bunch of local stuff in a nice little package that they all get ahead of time. And it's just great when the screen pops Getting up. Getting hungry right now. Yeah. <laughs> when the screen pops up and you see all the red um, and, uh, and it, they, they've been a, literally a blast. They run about an hour and um, hosted and moderated by Fastlane. And um, I'll, uh, I know most of them all because of those validation calls. So I keep my part pretty short, but I let uh, my team and they get to toss it to whoever they want. They'll go around and do some quick introductions. But what we make really clear from the beginning of that happy hour is that that night and the next day is all about the candidate, right? That that they they came and they're ready, right? And that we've we've dedicated that next day to them. So, but we do some icebreakers and yeah. just and then let them go around and we ask them, you know, who they are, where they're from, what attracted them to Mosquito Shield, and what they hope to learn tomorrow. And we'll even customize our presentation. I mean, I got an um, as you mentioned, I got an amazing team. They'll make notes, and if their deck, their individual department that they run, if that if their presentation doesn't have exactly what somebody might have asked for, they, they make a note to work it in. So, um, and then the day just kicks off the next day with a day in the life. They spend an hour with our ops team. Um, they go into the marketing department and that's, that's an hour and a half plus that takes them up to lunch. They come out of lunch. I do a, uh, a van overview video that we created to show them the inner workings of the van. And then, uh, they go into the sales center and they learn about the, the, um, all the offerings that we can provide from a support standpoint. And then the neat thing we do at the end is they all go into a open Q and a room where they can ask any follow-up because we keep it on time. That's really important. So ops gets an hour and we stop yep. questions and they can save them until the open Q and a, and there's every somebody from every department in the open Q and a, but I go onto a different zoom and I do a one-on-one -on -one with Scott. They get 20 minutes with me. Um, they can go back afterwards to the open Q&A if they want. But that 20 minutes is sort of that um, we don't we don't close on that. That's just sort of the, you know, the last chance that they have the, kind of the moment of truth. Like, did you get all your questions answered? What did you think of the day? And then what do you have for me? What What's mm -hmm. where's your head at? What you know, um, but we book the decision call on that 20 minute one on one. So by the time that one on one call is done. Um, it's usually every Tuesday. So they know by either Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, um, TJ from Fastlane is calling them to, so all their mapping has been done, unit economics, FDD, like all that stuff is done yep. prior to them coming. And then it's just that a lot of them will just say, I'm ready to go. Um, and that's where the, that's yep. where the, um, that's where the no comes in, right? For me with my VP of Fastlane, right? We've gotten to work really well together. So all of us say, um, Hey, Scott, I know this isn't like the time for you to make a decision, but I want to thank you. I really appreciate you and, and, um, and all the time. And anytime that you're making such a big, you know, hopefully positive life altering decision and mosquito shield is at the end of that with you. It means the world to us. I hope that came across from our team today. And uh, I know you've got a couple of days and you're getting on with TJ and Friday, but just know over the next couple of days that it's a yes from us. So like TJ will know that like our brand is good and, and, uh, and I'll say to him like, Scott, I don't want you spending the next couple of days going, man, I'm wondering what they're thinking. I really just know we're thinking yes. And then if it's yeah. somebody that I'm on the fence with, yeah. I don't say that. And TJ knows. So then we'll regroup afterward and say, all right, what do we have to do with Scott? What's wrong? Why? And, um, so, you know, that's typically how the one-on-ones go. And that kind of high level is, is makes up our confirmation process. So that um, I want to highlight a few things you said there and say them again because I thought they're so valuable. One is the finer touches, right? Sending everyone a red shirt from with Mosquito Shield's logo on it, so the sea of reds on the call. Uh, having your people all show up in black uniforms, uh, having them receive a, a gift from Mosquito Shield in advance with some nice touches, finer touches. Those these are these are all really really good things that not everyone's doing. And I think that uh, we can learn from. 
And that call, you said, was one hour before the, as you call it, uh, confirmation day, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the night that's before. That's like the uh, night before. How long is your confirmation go for from beginning to end when you add up it all, add it all up? Uh, typically nine Eastern to three Eastern. And then we'll start, depends on the size of the group, but then we'll start the, um, the, the one-on-one -on -one start at three o'clock. Okay. So you do the, 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 the group session is the six hours with a lunch break. Yes. Uh, and at the end of that, you're doing that 20 minute interview where you're basically confirming the client, or the mm -hmm. candidate. Yep. They all have a time and slot. How many people... Right, each has, a, has an actual interview slot with you post yeah. mm -hmm. confirmation day. How many people do you typically have coming to these confirmation days? Like, is there a number? Like, do you always hold them no matter what? Is there only one person? Do you still do it? Do you we have do. to wait till there's ten? Like, how do you handle that? No, um, we 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 do. Um, we've done as little as one, and we've done as many as um, fourteen. Okay. Yeah, but the fact is, you you do it whether there's one or fourteen. You you've planned it. It's scheduled. It's going to be done. Absolutely. And you mentioned there that TJ, who's uh, is it your VP of sales? Was that you call him? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he works for for Fastlane. Is he the one doing the like after you're done that interview? Is TJ the one that's getting back with him to confirm, get the documents signed and close? Are you are you involved post interview? No, he handles all of that. So once we agree that, okay. you know, that um, everything's in, you know, all the boxes have been checked, territory's good, and all of that stuff is lines up, um, then it's a go, and he handles and just pushes everything through. Yeah, got it. Okay, um, we're, we're getting close here to where I'm going to open questions up to those who are, who are listening or watching. Feel free in the chat if you've got any questions to go ahead and do that. I've got, I've got a couple questions left for Michael myself though I want to ask before we get to yours. Uh, you know, we all, all of us on this call, if you're a franchise or have just finished going through the item 19 or the, the FDD season, uh, lots of fun auditing and documents and revising item 19s and revising different elements of the business. Maybe just Michael, t tell us about, cause I think it's in my view, the most important element in that document, which I, I look at the FDD as being a sales document. That's how you actually sell something legally and, 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 in, in a lot of time and effort is you spent on that to get it done right. I'd love to get your thoughts as to how you have treated the item 19 and how you use that as a means to sell Mosquito Shield. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the two most important items in the document are seven and 19, because people are gonna wanna know how much does it cost me to get into it, right? Which is item seven, and then how much can I make? And I think if, um, I think, uh, if both of those are is um, clean, and transparent as possible. So the fewer notes, you know, the fewer exceptions, the fewer, you know, lines of fine print, um, you know, the, the better it is. So what I always like have always challenged myself with is if we're making notes, like really reading them and thinking like, you know, why and do we have to present it this way? And, and you know, and what's the downside if we don't? And really just trying to make, um, and I think I've, I've, I've known over the years, just the comments that, um, and we've sold, we have a lot of attorneys in our franchise system and, and just being told that, you know, our document in general is one of the, the cleanest, easiest to get through, um, that people have seen, I think, um, is really important. So item 20 is the fallout, right? So that's also, I think, you know, how many have come in, how many have left. So I think that that, um, yep. plays a role in that, but I think, um, to me, it's, Item seven is how much is it going to cost me to open this? And then they go right to item 19 and they're told to, right? Everyone's pushing people to looking at and understanding item 19s. Um, but for me, an item 19 should be, um, should be honest, should be as clean and, and uh, clear as possible. You mentioned you have some lawyers that are, are franchisees. Um <laughs> I would love to hear about how you handle people looking to make changes or, you know, addendums and modifications to your, how do you handle that? Do you, do you allow people to make modifications to your FDD? Like uh, never. add an addendum to the agreement and make. No, that was one of the best, best. No, never. It was one of the best pieces of advice I was given early on um, is, you know, get your document, get it right. And then 
stick with it. Like do not have exceptions, do not have, um, and, uh, down the road, it really, there's, it really paid off. Um, so, you mm-hmm. know, I think that that was just really great advice that I would pass on is, um, be really confident, you know, the first year, um, the first year or two, it, there were a lot of changes in our document, right? They were, I mean, it's so boilerplate that a lot of things don't necessarily like apply to yeah. our business, like that kind of language and what you can get out of there and, and clean it up. But, um, but no, don't, don't, do not get into, um, making deals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to just state that again, because I think it's really good advice. Uh, don't let people change your FDD agree- or French's agreement. Uh, avoid addendums unless you apps. I mean, there, I think there are maybe some some things I've seen happen that have to do with trusts that are purchasing, for for example, that require some kind of modification there that's not material in any way. It's more of like a legal element, mm-hmm. but uh, keeping your standard agreement and not negotiating on that agreement. Yes, yeah, so I think that's the, great the, the technical Thank term. You. Yeah, the technical term, don't don't make material changes for one person over another. It's so like the material changes can't happen. Yeah, you've got it. Yeah, that's uh, super helpful. Okay, I've got a, another question for you now on just, you know, as you mentioned it earlier in our interview that, you know, there, one of the downsides to having an FSO was just all that growth and the pressure it placed on the organization to support adding 100 and plus new owners, right, in, in the course of a year and a half. Maybe just talk to us through like where those hires happened first. Did you, was it, did you just, did you just know because there was pain in that area so you hired somebody or did you get a higher head of that? Or how did you manage that growth and make it so that um, you could, you could still run the business effectively? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things we did is um, we quickly were realizing that each department was doing really well onboarding a new franchisee in their own little world, right? In their, in their, like their lane. So ops did a great job and then just off off the Z went, the new Z, right? And marketing did a great job, but off they went. And then we were quickly realizing that um, organizationally, none of us knew where that Z was in the process. Marketing knew they did their job and ops knew they did their job and software department did their, and so on, but nobody knew collectively. So the first thing we did is we brought in a, um, we created a position called franchise administrator and, uh, and that person starts the onboarding process. So um, we really took a lot of the things away from each department that were sort of general and we built an onboarding process. So um, the new candidate comes in, the new franchisee, and they're given a very structured, formal onboarding, runs over an hour, gives them all the things they need to do initially. You know, the ACH forms and insurances and all the stuff they have to have. And as um, and we track it all electronically. So as those tasks are being completed, it's properly notifying. Well, it notifies us if they're behind schedule because we set dates on it. So you need to get us this by then. Um, it alerts them and alerts us so we can prod them and keep them moving. But it also alerts the departments. So marketing doesn't need to onboard them until they, you know, they're getting a van, they've done the right things. Like there's no reason for marketing to be onboarding them until they're ready for that part of it. And same with ops and same with software. Yeah. So just putting some structure around it, that one hire freed up my existing people and it gave me more time to then really figure out who was next and in what department needed it the most. So I think that was a big key for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I've seen it called sure start coordinator or, or, uh, you know, quick start coordinators. I've seen that in brands as they start to scale that the first six months, right. Of a franchisee's existence as they've just been born in the world of business in many cases is, is so critical to get done right. Mm-hmm. And it can make the whole process be so much more smooth. Uh, I, I think we've all seen it in franchising. It's really easy to spend all your time on that bottom 20% that's underperforming. But if you actually, often they are underperforming because they didn't start right. And so yeah. they stay in that area where they just become a burden almost when they shouldn't, they don't have to be if you get that onboarding done properly and, and get them uh, on their way. So I think that's um some great advice there. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Maybe, uh, we're, you know, we're getting near the end of our conversation here. Uh, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you had a, um, a sales center that was part of the business. 
Uh, that is, you know, some home service businesses do that. Uh, you launched your own. Maybe just talk a little bit about what the sales center did, what the, some of the challenges you had in building your own sales center. You're very, you know, your business is very seasonal. So you've got a lot of demand that all packs in in that March, April, and May. How did you manage that? Maybe just speak to kind of some of the pros and cons yeah, of trying I, to build your I, own sales center. If you can hear me, you cut out and froze on me. But, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a big undertaking on our part. Um, what we learned with outsourcing it was that uh, in the beginning, the seasonality hurt those outsourced companies. They weren't, their, their teams could not get up to speed fast enough with enough volume coming in. That was a years ago when we didn't have nearly the number of franchisees. I think it's a different model for us moving forward where we can drive more volume quicker. So people on the phones can get better at it faster. But um, I think, if you're in a if you're in a system or a model that is really heavily relying on sales um, versus appointment setting, you know we're not appointment setters. We don't go out and measure properties. We sell right then and there when the lead is in front of us. Yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of a lot of rooms, a lot of sales rooms or call centers aren't geared towards that. Very specific reason why we named ours a sales center and not a call center. So. Um, we ask for the order mm -hmm. and we try to make the sale for our franchisees. But the reason was, Scott, we were listening to phone calls because we realized back in 2017, we were driving, our marketing was getting better and better and we were driving more leads, but we weren't, uh, we were putting on customers proportionately and we started listening to phone calls yep. and, and shame on us, but we just realized our franchisees were terrible at selling, right? And and why wouldn't they be? I mean, mm -hmm. most of them didn't come from that background. So for any of you on the on this That's to have right. expectations yeah. that everybody knows how to sell, not the case, right? So we knew quickly we had to take it out of their <laughs> yeah. hands. Yeah, we had to take it out of their hands. And we got them to really think about what they can do daily to make the phone ring, and then we'll handle it when it does. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the philosophy behind outsourcing sales calls. These can't handle it. They're not great at it. Let them do what they're, you know, should be doing, which is taking care of the customers and networking and, and driving and pushing those leads. Yeah, that's that's some great advice. Uh, Michael, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for giving us uh, this this part of your day. Uh, this has been great for me as well, just to learn more. Even though we're working together now, I, I love these conversations to learn Same more here. about your business. And so thank you for the participation and great time. Great to have this time with you. And uh, thank you for all those of you who had, had questions. and participating. So we will see you all next month. Same time, same place, same channel. Thanks, awesome. Michael. Thanks so much.